Thanks. <laughs> and then as I'm taking them out, I can't figure out how to fit that in. It was, it was awful. It was agonizing. Then, as I'm leaving, I set off the alarm. And the lady said, can I see your sail slip? Well, I had just thrown it in one of the <laughs> millions bags. of bags. <laughs> so it took us a search just to find the sail slip. And then we had to figure out what made it leak. And she said, did the, did the lady forget to take off one of the... And I said, I said, I'll check. I don't, I don't know anything about this. So I said, oh, because I wrote the same plastic thing. On my mascara. I said, I bet it's the mascara. Well, it was, I said, I don't know. We were running it through. And she said, well, it's here on the slip. So we knew I paid for it. One box. Then we had one box. That Marilyn? Yes. How do you have that? That Marilyn. And what do you want to yeah, I'd like to coordinate with us yeah, on that at the top. Testings, which I plan to do all throughout Ohio. I'm sorry. In Champaign County yesterday. And there wasn't a reservation type thing. It just opened the public. So there was room a little bit in this one. And there were no tables, just chairs, which were spread out. And then people like, start talking and painting, and people started tripping in. And pretty much it was packed. <laughs> No six feet apart. So this is uh, a compliment to this lady here who decided to be a little more socially responsible. But it was fun. Really. Okay, so for our Zoom folks, I'm gonna try to I'm gonna stand right in front of you for just a minute. Okay. So that's okay. okay. <laughs> We're right next to you, so we won't be socially distanced right now. Hello to everybody on Zoom. I'm not sure how well you can uh, see me, but hopefully you'll be able to hear me and you'll be able to see Bob. Hello to everybody in the room. Thank you so much for joining us um, in person today. This is our first in-person program in 2021. So we really appreciate you coming out today. Um, <laughs> I apologize. The last two pregnancies, uh, my, my greatest symptom has been that I cannot breathe. <laughs> so, <laughs> it'll sound like I'm just about ready to keel over here every time. Um, if this is the first time that you've come to Brown Bag, usually I like to give an update on the programming that we have coming up. Um, and so our programming is still a little bit sparse this year, but we're, we're ramping things up a little bit. The most important thing for you to know is that we are auctioning off the Hancock County Barn paintings and the Crawford County Barn paintings um, that you've seen today in the museum. So the Hancock County Barn paintings are in the hallway. And if you're interested in purchasing those or bidding on those, you can do so online. So all the bidding will take place online and each painting has a QR code on it. Um, so if you have a smartphone, you can just scan that with your phone and it'll take you right to the site. If you would prefer when you get home, you can look up hancockhistoricalmuseum.org and you'll have all the information on our homepage to access the bidding page. And bidding will go through next week, uh, April 8th, it'll end at 8 p.m. So if you would like to purchase one of those paintings, you'll need to bid between now and April 8th. And again, um, Crawford County paintings are in the exhibit center. Um, classic movie night we have coming up this month. If you've not attended one of those before, they're great fun. Again, in person, we're happy to have people um, we are limiting attendance, so we'd like for you to call and make a reservation, but it is free April 16th, and Raiders of the Lost Ark is the movie. So a more modern classic, but a lot of fun for sure. Um, and then our next brown bag lecture will be Thursday, May 6th. Again, we're going to do a hybrid uh, format, so you'll be able to come in person, make your reservation early if you'd like to come. Um, and our speaker will be Jerry Sisser. He'll be talking about pre-code Hollywood. So if you um, attended, this is the third part. Um, each year he's done a lecture on early Hollywood, early films, early silent films. Um, so this is the third um, issue of that. So May 6th for that, again, free and open to the public. 
So now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker. And he was so eager to get started, he wasn't even going to accept formal introduction. <laughs> our speaker today is Dr. Robert Kroger. And um, it's been my great pleasure to get, to get get to know Rob from a distance over the last few years and to finally meet him in person for the first time today. He is a native of Youngstown and graduated from Ohio State University's College of Dentistry and served four years of active duty in the US Navy, ending with the rank of Lieutenant Commander. He practiced general dentistry in Cincinnati from 1977 to 2010 when he retired. He and his wife, Laura, enjoy spending time with their nine grandchildren. Dr. Kroger is a second generation artist. His father, Francis, held an art degree from Notre Dame. Dr. Kroger is a prolific author. He's have, he has published two books on dentistry, a book on vitality and seven books on golf in Scotland, England, Wales, and Ireland. Today, he will be speaking with us about his Ohio Barn Project, an effort that has led him to paint historic barns in all 88 counties of Ohio. And he will also be signing his new book, Historic Barns of Ohio. Dr. Bob, thank you for joining us. Uh, do you want to mention this is going to be for? Yeah, thank you. We've been, I think, hopefully everybody heard as you came in today, but the painting that Bob started this morning and has finished up for us, this beautiful um, painting, will be raffled off today at the end of his lecture. So if you would like to partake in that raffle, you can purchase tickets at the front uh, desk. $5 for one ticket, $3, or excuse me, $10 for three tickets. Thank you. Please help me to welcome Dr. Bob. <laughs> I will. I will. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Finally, get a chance to meet her. Everything happens for a reason, you know. Uh, like this. I think I just broke it. The same thing yesterday. You'll be fine. Oh, okay. You'll be all right. Put this back in. Only the highest quality technology for us here. <laughs> uh, if I had a robust voice, it wouldn't be a problem, but I don't, so I need this. <laughs> Figure out what the is. If it works, it's okay. Then we'll just... It's fine. Yeah, That's okay. You just hold it. That's right, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I need somebody to hold this note. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, let's start. So thank you to Sarah. And this, this, I'm sorry, is not a barn in Hancock County. It's not even a barn in Ohio. But I painted it yesterday with Champaign Historical Society. And I'll do it at the end of the month down in uh, Shelby County. But uh, it's kind of the barn I'd like to, I'd like to see. It's fallen apart. It's probably gone by now. It's from Fulton County, Georgia. Wow. And a friend of mine uh, had a daughter who was a principal of a school for children with developmental disabilities and so forth. So she wanted me to do some paintings for a fundraiser, so I did. And she took some photos from a photographer. I don't know if it's permission or not. Anyway, this is a barn in Fulton County, Georgia. And so I, I called it something, but then I called it, uh, I titled it Broken because it is broken. You can see the board sticking through and so forth. And I did a little quote in the back of it. And she called me uh, uh, maybe a month later. And she said, where did you get that quote? I said, what quote? And the quote was on the, on the painting. And uh, so she read it to me. I said, oh, I made that up. <laughs> um, so it goes something like this. Uh, I like broken seashells, which I do when I'm down the beach. I call it broken seashells because uh, they remind us of our lives and our hearts, which sometimes get broken. But what's important is what you do with the pieces. And so that's on the back of this painting. This is broken. So I will eventually do paintings from the counties. Uh, but I, I thought, well, I'll do three of these. And, uh, and that way it shares a little bit. Now, I am not a college educated artist. And another one of me to do a little bit of painting. So I'll take my palette knife. And I'll splash some color in now. In just a second, the painting will be finished. <laughs> so that's how I think. 
Uh, I do use a brush if there's something that's very fun to do, like a little scoopula or whatever. Uh, but the paint with the cotton knife. And whoever gets the painting, if you kick it out of the bright sunny day with the sun being coming right at it, you just tilt it 20, 30, 40, 50 degrees. You'll see different painting because the texture of it allows the sunlight to reflect in different directions. So it almost becomes a different painting. If you put it in the house, you can hang it as it is, or you can mount it in a fancy frame, which makes it a better portion. And again, if the sunlight comes in, you'll see a different painting throughout the day. So that's one reason why I like the, the imposter technique. It's very thick. So, yes, my dad uh, had an art degree. And uh, I did a little bit when I was a kid. Uh, I wasn't very good. He didn't really teach me. I wish he did. He was very much. In those days, you couldn't really support a family on, on art. So he worked as a commercial artist for a steel company in Youngstown. Took me to uh, a wonderful museum in Youngstown called the Butler Art Institute. Has anybody been there? Well, it's worth the trip. It was the first museum, first art museum in the country to focus only on American art. And we've got some wonderful stuff in there. So then I uh, went, to, went to college and uh, the Navy, uh, went to Cincinnati, set practice up, uh, raised five kids, and my wife died. And I don't know if there are any widowers in this group, but believe me, uh, women had a big advantage when their spouse died because women have. Uh, a big social network, and they can go out to a movie, go out to dinner, but men can't do that. We can play golf, and that's about it. So <laughs> you get lonely, so I remarried, and uh, my wife, Laura, decided to start a tradition, which is how this barn project started. And it's very interesting because uh, I'm still not sure I understand it, but uh, the tradition she started was to have it. Surprise anniversary trip. So one year it's her turn, one year it's my turn. 2012 it was her turn. So she takes me out to Licking County, which is about an hour east of Columbus. And we stayed at a bed and breakfast out in the country. As we turned down the road, there on a little rise was an old gray barn. The roof was sagging or boards missing. It was tilted. And this is so hard to describe, but it's very real. A message came almost like a thunderbolt right into my eyes. You're going to paint this barn, you're going to write about it, and you're going to preserve Ohio history. Wow. Uh, so we talked about it that night. And the next morning, Saturday morning, drove to the farmhouse right next to the barn, circa 1830, knock on the door. Uh, I know it's early Saturday morning. Uh, this older <laughs> fella. And the somebody comes to the door, what do you want? You know, he hadn't shaved in a couple of days, no shoes on, what do you want? So I explained what happened, uh, the inspiration, and can you tell me about your barn? He told me about the, uh, the Welsh from the East Coast coming in, funding the county, which they did. The Civil War grants to the soldiers who fought in the war. The gun shop across the street, and we opened up, and I really saw the love of a barn. That was my first exposure to somebody who loved his barn, even though it's falling apart. <laughs> and I wasn't sure it was still standing because the book thing had been going on for about two years. And so I drove out there last spring and just took it even more, <laughs> <laughs> but it's still there. So that's how it started. Um, and I, uh, I really uh, I don't know if you all believe in this, but. Uh, one thing after another just happened. Uh, Matt Reese uh, did a story on me. He got me connected to Dick Crawford County and his dad, Dave Reese, and the Barnes here, which I've been a number of. And it was almost like I'm just a little puppet on the strings being manipulated by a guy, big guy upstairs. And you know, I, I just have had doors open uh, one after the other. You know? And uh, the book thing came along, and I was thinking about doing a book four or five years ago, but not quite so soon. Uh, I had envisioned a coffee table book, full color. Uh, we have at least one artist 
Any more artists besides this lady that gave me a present? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, she, um, you know, it's almost like an ego trip, you know. And that was going to cost 40, 50 bucks. So then when the history press approached me, out of blue, um, I knew their books were six by nine inches, paperback, color insert. But at the time, the rep said there was an option of full color lines, but uh, <laughs> that, that's okay. Uh, to myself, do you want the ego trip of a big book or do you want a six by nine to spread the gospel of the old barn? So, easy decision to make. I'm very happy. Uh, so, I kept doing this, and I know how I, I know how it started, but you know, I, I really didn't realize why I was doing this. I know that sounds crazy, but when you're ordered to do something, you, you do it. And so, I have a couple of books on uh, photography by Edward Curtis, who took, took photographs around 100 years ago of the Native Americans in the Southwest and the West and the Northwest. In 1890 to about 1920, his photographs in the Library of Congress. And there's a quote in the second book I bought about why he does this, to preserve a way of life, which will be gone soon. Now, you all know this much more than people in the suburbs, the cities. But it really hit home when I got a phone call in February from Dave Reese. And I said, Bob, a uh, barn burned down, purely accidentally. And then chaos, it was very cold, heat lamps, short circuit, and bingo, it's gone. And it's a wonderful old barn. Uh, one of those uh, new ones that they maintain very well and still being used. And then he said something that really clicked. He said, Bob, it did burn down, but at least we had your painting of it as a memory. And then I said, okay, I know I do this. No problem. So thank you for that. Uh, and by the way, he's a great, a great barn staff. So, so the first barn I'll talk about is from here. And I titled this one Boyd's Brew. And it was uh, five o'clock after our first day of touring, and I'm tired. And uh, they said, I think I've got a barn you might like. It wasn't on the tour, it wasn't on your biennial tour, but they said, I think it's the kind of barn you like. It's kind of falling apart. <laughs> so we drive down this long driveway and pull in. Farmhouse is on the right, barns on the left. And as we pull in, some other car comes in. And it's the owner, uh, Al Schwab, our, our luck. And he tells us about the bar. And yes, we can go in. It's a very old barn, timber frame, wonderful barn. I like the uh, color of the roof. And uh, uh, they uh, had a good story, too, because it traces back to the 1880s when the barn uh, was built. And in 1880, the population of Finley was 4,600. And then bingo, as you know, natural gas discovered, oil was discovered. And the great cargo shoots a flame up 100 feet in the air, we see 30 miles away. And 10 years later, 1890, the population is uh, 18,000. Uh, so quite a story on the, the farm, which was owned by Cindy's grandfather at the time. There are many, many natural gas wells, so the workers would stay in the farmhouse. So it kind of, kind of had a nice story, too. Uh, the second barn is Nutwood, and this is one I was just at yesterday in Champaign County. It's a wonderful barn. If you haven't seen it, even though it's on private property, you can see it from the roof. Kind of hard to find. It's a round barn made of bricks. It's got a great story to it. Maintained very well by the current owners. I haven't met you. We had to trespassing the first time. <laughs> but it goes back to 1815 when a fellow named William Ward founded this, this farm. And he was an interesting fellow. He was a, vet, a veteran of the Revolutionary War. And for his service, he got some land grants. But he was also a land speculator, as many were in those days. Uh, there were fortunes made and fortunes lost. Uh, oh, yes, they were. Uh, and that's what he did. Now, prior to land offices, if you wanted some land in the Northwest Territory in Kentucky, 
You took your axe and you made axe marks in trees and that laid out your land, as some people did, uh, like the frontiersman Simon Kenton. Simon had his land all marked out, but poor Simon was illiterate and he didn't believe in things like land officers. So when they came and they told people if they had X marked land, they had to register and they didn't. So William Ward bought off some of his land and uh, he didn't turn his back on Simon Kenton because he knew he was a patriot. So he became partners with him. And by 1810, they had accumulated 25,000 acres. Uh, and William Ward was also a pretty savvy guy. So he convinced the Ohio legislature to form Champaign County and to put the county seat or banner right next to his, his farm. Uh, he was a very clever guy. The next part of the story uh, was uh, a young lad named Absalom, strange name, Jennings. And he was born in 1815. Now, we died in 1822, so you never, never knew him. But when he was 15, he came to Urbana to work in this, making saddles and harnesses. And he was kind of an entrepreneur too, so he started his own company in Marysville and became very good at it. So good, he moved to New York City and started a company making hats and caps and clothing and fantastically, fantastically wealthy. So much so, he bought racehorses. He loved racehorses, but his heart was in Ohio. So in 1856, uh, he purchased Nutwood Place. And he came back years later and he built this barn, a round barn, which is very, very rare in 1858. Mm -hmm. The only one earlier was in Western Massachusetts, built by the Shakers. That was round also. Uh, as far as I know, as far as historians know, there weren't any other circular barns, octagonals, but no circular barns. So why he made that, I don't know, but he made a spiral staircase in the middle of it up to a big observatory cupola so he could watch his racehorses going around the track a mile long around the farm. <laughs> and he, he was just uh, an interesting fellow. Uh, National Register in 76, uh, it's 100 feet in diameter, 286 feet in circumference. And he also did something very, very, very smart. He put tin on the roof, 7,000 square feet. That was expensive in 1858. Um, and the owners uh, take good care of it. Now, this is Jeff Warren here today by any chance? No, okay. So this is a Hancock County barn. And I call it the handshake. All right, so I had a back problem a year and a half ago, so I couldn't finish the last three counties. Wyandotte, Union, Marion, Union, three counties to go. So I made, I made contacts, I got the barns, and I was all set for uh, last early April. And I thought, well, I'll do a barn tour in Hancock County in the morning, hit those three counties and drive home because the hotel, until it was closed where I stayed, <laughs> everything was very fearful. And I'm all set to go and the state shuts down. So, oh, what do I do, you know? I don't want to get arrested. So I looked very carefully at the website and uh, Governor DeWine had one loophole that I thought I could use and that was for nonprofits. I thought, well, almost all my paintings go into nonprofits, fundraisers. So I printed that page out, put it on the front seat of my car, and I thought, if I could stop by the virus case, at least I'll have an excuse, but maybe I won't get arrested. So I came up, uh, met Dave and Gary Wilson, and went to our first barn, owned by Jeff Horn. Old barn, uh, founded by Levi Sampson in 1839, timber frame, very nice, very long. And Gary, and Gary and Dave told me uh, Jeff was a big hog farmer. So we pull into the lot. Jeff's out there already. I'm the first to get out. I walk up to him. And now we've got mandage. Uh, no hugging, no touching. <laughs> Jeff puts his hand out. I haven't, I haven't shaken his hand in a week or two. 
So what do I do? Am I, are we going to be rude and ignore him? Or am I going to shake hands with him, take a chance? So I shook hands with him. <laughs> Meanwhile, Dave and Gary are back and they don't shake hands. <laughs> oh, thanks. Uh, so, <laughs> so I uh, uh, got some book for the frame and I brought that painting today for future fundraisers. And uh, get in the car, driving away, and, and Dave says, uh, Bob, don't worry because Jeff's a big hog farmer, and if he had the virus, his hogs would be sick. So you're okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that, Dave. <laughs> you're okay. Uh, the next barn is a commercial um, for an event that we had planned for May 1st, and all 88 born in counties were going to be in. But the organizers in Westchester decided to move it to September 29th. So feel free to take a flyer up here. Um, this is on Zoom. So in Westchester did this just a few weeks ago. It's there you are, Zoom. Uh, and it's going to be a wonderful fundraiser for some local nonprofits. The barn is spectacular. The editors of the book liked it so much they put it in the front cover, actually. It's called the Mulhouse Barn. And it's a great story. And it goes back to Cincinnati Beer. I call this barn the Beer Baron's Barn. So because it was. And a little, a little alliteration there, too, for you writers out there. Uh, it's got a slate roof with the name G. Molehouse or 1881 on it. And it goes back to Conrad Windish, who was born in Bavaria, 1825. He worked at his dad's brewery in, Germ in Germany. Germans loved their beer. And uh, they moved to Cincinnati, served a brewery in his 20s with a fellow named Christian Warlock. And they had a nice brewery going. Well, the other part of the story is Gottlieb Mulhauser, born in Bavaria too, a little bit later, comes to Cincinnati in 1845, but his dad dies four years later when the kid's only 13. So in those days, if you were the oldest, you went out and you worked. So he worked on a pottery. Then he moved to a mineral water factory. And he was uh, the same kind of kid, entrepreneurial spirit. So then he started his own mineral water business and pretty successful. By age 21, he had enough uh, money to marry the sister of Conrad Windish. Uh, he built a grist mill and another mill, and he was making flour for this Civil War effort, uh, supplying the army, and made a lot of money. So after the war, Windish sells his partnership and forms a partnership with Mulhauser and the Windish Mulhauser Brewery. And it was downtown for what's called Over the Rhine, which was a very German area. And the reason why they called it Over the Rhine was part of the canal, Ohio Erie Canal, Miami Erie Canal, and through there to the river. And so many Germans there feeling homesick, they would cross over the canal and they called it crossing over the Rhine, meaning the Rhine River in Germany. So it's still known at that area. So this brewery stretched two, three city blocks long, had two concrete lines on top, each weighed 10, 10 tons each, believe it or not. Huge things. Very, very productive. Uh, Germans loved their beer. And this brewery was the third busiest in Cincinnati. They, they made an awful lot of money. And in 1893, Cincinnatians drank an average of 40 gallons for every man, woman, and child. And you know the kids weren't drinking 40 gallons a year. <laughs> so, uh, two and a half times the national average. My uncle. Well, you know, <laughs> Carrie Nation came to town. She was a temperance gal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> She's the one who carried the axe and she'd smash in saloons wherever she went. And come to Cincinnati, it goes over the Rhine, it takes one look down Vine Street, counts 136 saloons. And she just left. She said, I would have dropped that from exhaustion <laughs> if I decided I was going to try that. So she just left. <laughs> anyway, uh, up north in Westchester, that's Westchester now, uh, they grew the hops and the grains, shipped them down to over the Rhine through the brewery, and they stored them in this barn. Well, the family maintained through the years, but uh, an insurance company bought the land, 
and they were going to take it down. And Westchester Township heard about it, so they bought it for a buck. And the Mulhauser family graciously decided to take the barn apart, beam by beam, just like they do in the barn builders on TV, label everything. Westchester paid that moved and put back together on top of a little hill over a pond. It's a beautiful city. And I hope, I hope you can come down because it's only two minutes off I-75. Uh, wonderful restoration. It opened in 2008. They've had over a thousand vets there. Has it, has it paid off? Probably not because they don't charge very much. You booked up for a couple years. Uh, in fact, we had to take a per week day of that. But it's a nice, uh, nice restoration. And uh, I'm very proud that, uh, that they, they did that. And the barn doesn't get a lot of recognition. So I'm hoping that along with the exhibit, the barn will get a little publicity too. Now, this next one is uh, audience participation. <laughs> so uh, I know I know Lauren is here. Is Lauren somewhere? There she is. She's running the Zoom. Oh, hi, Lauren. Okay. Hi, Bob. Nathan here? Hi, Nathan. I thought that was you. Okay. Well, Lauren grew up nearby this farm that her great 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 grandfather owned, and uh, it uh, traced back to the 1800s. It's a wonderful barn. It's got the longest squid beam I have ever seen, 80 feet long. Wow. And in those days, Ohio was a huge forest. These trees would be 80, 100 feet tall, straight as an arrow, no branches. So they chop them down, use axes and axes to square them up, uh, cut these little grooves called mortise in them, and then uh, cut another piece, another beam called a tenon. It's like a little tongue that would fit into the mortise. And then use a hand auger to drill a hole, uh, stick a little wooden peg in there, a wooden nail, and raise it up with the whole community. It was magnificent. They did not have college degrees in architecture or engineering, but by goodness, they could build a barn. Uh, and that's how this one was built. So unfortunately, uh, owners uh, did not maintain it, went out of the family, and it was up for sheriff's share. We can say that, but it did. But with every disappointment, there's an opportunity. So Lauren and her husband purchased, and it was a dream come true. Uh, and they fixed up the farmhouse, which is wonderful, and they put a roof on the barn to preserve it, and they've taken great care to preserve a nice piece of history. So I kind of thought that that was kind of a, a dream come true. And I thought back to a song sung by a young lady named Judy Garland, uh, in the uh, Wizard of Oz yeah. and uh, won the Academy Award for the best song that year. And I know some of you know it. Uh, mm -hmm. It goes something like uh, Somewhere over the rainbow, way up high, there's a land that I've heard of once in a little by. Somewhere over the rainbow, skies are blue. And the dreams that you dare to dream really do come true. Now, I know I won't get a record contract for that, but that's okay. I said gold once. But anyway, um, I know some of you uh, remember from the 1950s a TV show with a little band leader with a little goatee, Mitch Miller. And this guy was clever because he had audience participation too. Yeah. <laughs> right. So the words of a song would go on the screen. He'd have a sing along. And he asked the people in the audience to sing along. So I thought, well, I don't have a TV screen up here, but I'll save the words and then we'll have a little sing along here. <clears throat> because old barns can be fun. And, um, right. So the words are somewhere over the rainbow, way up high. There's a land that I heard of once in a little while. Somewhere over the rainbow, skies are blue, and the dreams that you dare to dream really do come true. Ready? Yes. One, two, three. Somewhere <laughs> over the rainbow, way up high, there's a land that I heard of once in a while. 
mushrooms and it goes back to uh, Highland County and my first my first barn scout and she was so lucky the editors for this magazine chose her painting to be on the cover oh wow that's the Ohio Farm Bureau and that's a story in itself because I was very lucky to be in there uh, and very proud to be in there too um, when I first started um, I had to learn to paint and draw again and take workshops and a good, good mentor in Cincinnati. And uh, I just started off on my own. Went up north into Warren County, got a few nice barns. And I was at a nice, nicely restored barn one day, knocked on the farmhouse door. Nobody answered, so I started taking pictures. I noticed down the road, maybe 300 yards, there was a little pond. Somebody was down there. And I, I wasn't quite sure what was going on, but he got on his ATV and drove up. And so he got a little closer, he got a beard down to his waist. I thought, this would be interesting, a character. And something across his waist. He's got a little closer, and something across his waist was a rifle. I said, well, this would be really interesting. <laughs> Somebody to talk to. <laughs> and what are you doing here? This is private property. You have no right to be here. You're taking pictures. Um, so then I explained what I was doing, and he was very nice. And he told me all about the barn and about the people that owned it. But then I realized he was right. And I was lucky I didn't encounter any guard dogs uh, or anybody with the rifle could shoot. So um, I sent some feelers out to historical societies. And the society in Highland County uh, got me in contact with a lady uh, who was wonderful. And Sandy had worked for the USDA and she knew all the farmers and she grew up there. And we went on many barn tours and we did some fundraisers for the 4 H and then for the Historical Society. And I'm not sure I would have kept doing this if it weren't for Sandy. So I was happy with the editor shows. Her painting to be on the cover of that, of that magazine. Anyway, so her barn was the first I visited when I first met her. And she and her husband uh, retired when they were 55. They saved their money, raised two children, and uh, they bought 50% ownership in this wonderful farm owned by this fellow's family. And his name was on the street when the laws came out. He had to have a, a street name. And, uh, uh, it was Howard Graybill, and uh, we were talking there uh, it's, uh, outside the farmhouse circa 1900, and Sandy said, uh, yeah, this is an old farm mess, and Howard, Howard was born here, and Howard said, no, I wasn't, uh, so Howard said that uh, in 1945, and his mom said it was time, her husband was nowhere to be found. He was out way out deep in the woods hunting mushrooms. <laughs> and and uh, which is where the title comes from, the painting. And so grandpa lived with them. And he said, get in the truck. So he got in the truck and they went to the hospital, but they never made it to the hospital. So Howard was born in a truck. <laughs> so that was, uh, a good story, but they're wonderful people. And, uh, I don't have anything scheduled, but we'll do something for them when they feel more comfortable because uh, uh, many historical societies, even now, aren't having live events like this. So I'm very grateful for, uh, for this opportunity to be with people instead of being on a Zoom, a Zoom call. The next barn is in my, my county, Hamilton, because the preacher's barn. And it's in a little village called Heritage Village, which is in a public park, a county park named Sharon Woods, near our Beltway 275. 
Uh, it's hard to find. Uh, it's got a collection of about a dozen old buildings from the area, old church, old school, old farmhouse, stone kitchen, and this old barn, which I had seen many, many times on my running. And finally, I went and talked to the director and asked him if I could paint it. I said, sure. And they gave me access to the archives, which uh, was a good story. And I call this the Preacher's Barn. And it traces back to 1751 when Philip Gatch was born in Maryland. And when he got into his 20s, he was a farmer, but he was also what they call a circuit rider, a preacher. He would go from village to village, preaching, getting donations, and converting to the Methodist faith and so forth. And uh, unbeknownst to Philip, uh, another circuit rider came to this little village and converted a woman without her husband's permission, <laughs> which is what he didn't do in those days. And when the husband found out about him, he told his friends he would take care of the next preacher in town. Unfortunately, that was Phil Gatch. And when Philip came in, he got tarred and feathered. Oh, and for those who don't know what that is, that's when they pour hot tar over you. Hot tar, yeah. It sticks to you. And then they throw goose or duck feathers all over you as a zombie. Anyway, he, uh, he cleaned up. He lost a little bit of sight in one eye. He went back to farming and preaching. But he grew disillusioned with slavery. So he sold his slaves in 1780. And you know, slavery was very common in those days, and we're part the judge, but uh, our president, who was on the dollar bill, uh, had hundreds and hundreds of slaves in his plantation, and so did Thomas Jefferson. So, you know, and he's still on the, still on the nickel, so uh, it's let's see, it changed so that far, uh, now. so far. Yeah, so, now. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, sold slaves, and then in 1798, he and three families moved. To, to what is now Ohio. It was not Ohio, it was part of the Northwest Territory in those days. Um, but he set up uh, a farm on the banks of the Little Main River, which is now in Claremont County. So this is not a true Hamilton County barn, but it's only one I had. I had 88 counties to see, so I figured I'd get, get barns in Hamilton County anytime. So I wasn't worried about that. Anyway, he became a judge, a legislature, he helped write Ohio's first constitution. And his anti-slavery ideas probably helped Ohio to become a free state. And uh, as time went on, uh, farm transferred from one family to another, but the barn was still in pretty good shape. And a nonprofit heard about it, and so they bought it. Another nonprofit took it into Heritage Village, and uh, that's why it's there. So it's originally in Claremont County, but it's a wonderful barn. If you ever get down there, uh, it's worthwhile seeing one with the other. Hard to find in the parks in Florida, it is. Uh, the next county is pretty close to Pauline County, and I call this painting Logistics. Oh, 15 minutes. Um, that's okay, we'll get at least one more funny one. Uh, well, I was on a roll because I had done Southeast Ohio. I got about 10 counties in one day, and, there's, and there, there are no uh, straight roads in Southeast Ohio. Right. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. Some of you have been there. Uh, it's wonderful, senior country. But my goodness, it's up and down, and up and right. Appalachia, it's famous. Uh, and uh, I did that. I thought, well, if you do that, you can do it. So I've got all the western counties. So I dropped off some paintings in Green, Green, uh, Greenville in Dark County for a fundraiser. And then I was going up north on 127, hitting Paulding, Benworth, and all those counties. And uh, I didn't have uh, contacts with the historical society. They didn't have any, any barns. I just was going to try to find whatever I could find. Uh, going into Indiana, where I've done some work in uh, Whitley County near Fort Wayne. So I see a nice barn complex in Paulding County. So I pull it over and it's snowing. Veterans Day weekend, snowing, snowing, blizzard. 
but it's a nice complex. So I'm doing compositions and taking photos. And here a semi comes down, uh, lights are on, and uh, the ground was warm, so it wasn't slippery. But it was it was a blizzard. It was a way up. I could see the two lights, and I thought, well, here's this courageous truck driver, and these guys don't get a lot of credit. Uh, out there braving the cold to deliver where he's supposed to deliver. So I call this logistics after that truck driver. Tried to find out the name of the, you know, the owners, couldn't. So I did a little digging and I found out about the name of the county. And it was a good story. And some of you know it. But for those of you who don't, it's a good story. And it traces it back to the Revolutionary War when these three poor farmers in upstate New York. Were, were farmers. One was named John Paulding, another Isaac Van Roer, and David Van Wert, but it was spelled Van Wert, David Williams. And but they were patriots and they didn't own their land because uh, in Great Britain, land was owned by relatively few families. You know, if you were a farmer, you were a tenant farmer, essentially. So the dream of owning your own land was important to these poor farmers. So they volunteered in the militia. So one night they're out patrolling and they catch this guy who's a British major. And in those days, you see, uh, the British army uh, was uh, much different than ours. And if you, if you wanted your son to be an officer, you had to buy his commission. So they were very wealthy families that could afford to do this. So Major John Andre was from a very wealthy family. So they, these three guys catch him and they're suspicious. So they search him. They take his boots off and they find some secret documents. Well, hmm, uh, Major Andre knows what's going on. So he uh, offers him a bribe, a lot of money, which had to be tempting because uh, in those days you farmed. Uh, just basically to support your family. And if you had any excess, uh, maybe you so, thought, maybe you didn't, but it was just a challenge to survive in those days. Uh, if they could go from year to year, it was great. Um, so they refused to bribe. They turned him in and watched him, watched him get hanged for what he was going to do. And the documents were aimed towards one of General Washington's most trusted generals who was in charge of West Point. If those documents had gotten to the general, it, it would have been a different outcome. We'd always speak in the King's English instead of American, you know. Uh, and that general was Ben McDonald. Well, he heard about this, so he escaped England. And he was lucky. Uh, and these three patriots received the very first military decoration, a silver, silver medal, and they also had their names on three of Ohio's western counties. So. Even though I didn't find the owner of the barn, I got this story. <laughs> okay. This next one is uh, Northeast Ohio. And I've got a number of good stories from Northeast Ohio. I call this Trophy Husband. <laughs> you know what a trophy wife is? <laughs> and these ritual guys uh, get tired. So, uh, they decide they want somebody young and blonde and pretty. And uh, of course, uh, it's true love, you know, 25 year old versus 75 year old. So there's no question it's true love. So they got their trophy wife, right? Well, this is trophy husband. So this is Maple Syrup, Maple Syrup Country, Geauga County. And uh, I just done Portage County. I pull into the driveway. Farmhouse is up on top of the hill. And I'm making notes in the last camera. It was April. It was kind of snow flurries. It was cold. And uh, I'm making notes. And this little thing comes bouncing down the stairs. Uh, gray hair. And she must have been 90 pounds. Excited that I was there. Telling me all about the sugar house in the woods circa 1910. And then about the barn, which is a wonderful barn. 1870s, timber framed. A uh, lovely bank barn, on and on and on and on and on. And then just across from us, a head pokes out of the door in uh, a sugar maple house. 
the modern one. And he's got a brown cap on. And he's got a beard, mostly dark, black, brown hair, some, some twinge of the gray. I figure he's about 50, 50, right? So she looks at me and he smiles. And she said, uh, that's my husband, Bill. Okay. So I, uh, and diplomacy is very important. When, when you got to the school, I so I picked her at 70, 50. So I just looked at her and I looked at him. Didn't say a word. She said, I know what you're thinking. We get this all the time. We get this in the grocery store. We get this in the malls. He's not my son, he's my husband. So he comes out then and he's laughing. And uh, anyway, uh, uh, took their picture. It's in the book, actually. And they'd been married 50 years at that time. It was a couple of years ago. And uh, I asked him how old he was. He said, 70. I said, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> anyway. Funny story. Another good story. Northeast Ohio, Trumbull County, close to where I'm from. And uh, this surfaced from a newspaper article. And I haven't had a newspaper article searching out barns in this county because Sarah says she knows about all the other barns. Maybe she does. I don't know. Anyway, I call this the Klondike. And it's owned by Jeff and Bonnie Matthews. And uh, I'm very, I'm very glad that uh, they came forward because it's a wonderful barn complex. They can't afford to keep it up any longer. Uh, the barn is huge, has slate roof, uh, matching on the chicken house, uh, on the milk house. Even the, the silo has an octagonal slate roof on. Believe it or not, uh, the farmer who did it uh, had. Uh, enough uh, affluence to put uh, his name, Frank Reed, on one of the roofs of the barn. The initials FHR on the other. So he wanted people to know he had some money. So, but he disappears. 1898, he's gone. Was he kidnapped? Uh, was he murdered? Nobody knew. A year later, his wife got a letter he sent to her. He left for the gold rush in the Klondike, in the mm -hmm. Canadian Yukon, where it goes down to 30 or 40 below zero. And that's not a windshield, folks. You know, he left. He was a prosperous Ohio farmer. Why would he leave, you know, prosperity and search for gold? So anyway, um, he told her to sell the farm and keep the proceeds for herself. So I'm assuming it wasn't the happiest of marriages. I, I don't know. Uh, Anyway, uh, she did sell it the next year, and in 1910, Jess family bought it, and they've owned it for 100 years. But they're, they're hoping somebody will step forward and repurpose it into something else. It's wonderful, wonderful complex. So I wondered again, why would a uh, prosperous Ohio farmer do it? So anyway, and they couldn't find the letter, but in the eight, 1980s, uh, his relatives from Texas wanted to see it, so they came up and they had the same story. So Frank must have got around, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, 100,000 people tried to get in the, the Yukon to strike a rich. Canada had to impose uh, a rule where you had to have a year's worth of supplies before you could enter, and that was heavy, thousands of pounds. So the people who made money were the people who would transport these people on there. And the people who were there already, you know, Dawson City was, was the site in 1896, population 500. 1898, when Frank got there, supposedly, population 30,000. Yeah, they were all there to strike it rich. The people who struck it rich were the suppliers. And egg cost $3. Wow. Three dollars equates to eighty-one dollars in today's. A can of butter, five dollars, a couple hundred dollars. So the people who made money were the ones that were there already. Okay, time-wise, one more story, I guess. <laughs> uh, no. This is the oldest farm in Ohio, but I'm sorry, we must go to Portage County. And discovered this one last fall. 
uh, Marine Porter who had the idea to do the article about how a farm bureau was on this tour. And she got the idea to do that story, so that was very, very lucky. Yeah. She did an uh, article for a small village newspaper in Portage County. I call this essay Land Girl. Has anybody heard of the Women's Land Army in the UK in World War II? No, I hadn't either. So I'm glad you haven't heard of this. It's sharing a piece of history. Well, the first farm you visited was owned by Dorian Sidner. And Dorian's about five foot one, weighs about 85 pounds. And so we're talking, and I've been over to the UK many times. So I know somebody from England, somebody from Scotland, know the accents, Welsh and Irish. So she's from England. And I can't think of what she was in her 90s, what she doing here. So she said that she met her husband during the war. And she got married after the war. And he had relatives in Cleveland, so they came back to Cleveland. They heard about this farm being for sale, so she came down there and has them did since the 1940s. And uh, she said, she piped up and she said, and I was a land girl. I said, you were? I didn't say. I was in the land's army. Uh, you were. I got a medal, too. Uh, I haven't seen it yet. I'm doing an event there in September, so I'm hoping I'll see the medal when she comes. Anyway, the land, the land, women's land army in the World War II was because many of the boys were over fighting the Germans and they needed food and milk and, uh, and meat. So the farms needed workers. So they recruited, they had volunteers and many from London. So the women went all over Great Britain doing farm work to support the war effort. They wore uniforms. They got, they got medals late, but they did get medals. And uh, they, they were wonderful. Uh, they worked in the Timber Corps, cutting down lumber left and right. And you've heard lumberjacks, well, they were lumber jills. So uh, <laughs> it's a great story. And uh, uh, time for one more, or is that it? Um, well, we might want to see if we have any questions for you. Okay, any questions? If anyone has any questions okay. on Zoom, um, I can questions. use the chat I'm function, which <laughs> is uh, the bottom, at the bottom yeah, of your screen, stories. and you can type it in, and I will <laughs> ask. One more, and then we'll have you sign. Uh, I'm in trouble now. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is the oldest farm in Ohio. And uh, Dave McCullough in his bestseller book, Pioneers, missed this story. But, uh, he did this uh, novel about, well, novel about the family of Marietta in 78. Well, this is the oldest farm in Ohio, owned by John Smiley, who was the sixth generation a number of years ago in Adams County. Very hilly property, hard to find. Uh, and his ancestor was Alexander Smiley, who was in the court of King George. And I don't know what happened, but King George granted them 500 acres of this land, which was Shawnee territory and Delaware territory, and Miami's Mingos. It, it, it wasn't it wasn't settled, you know. And so they settled that farm in 1772, and now it's in sixth generation. I met uh, his son, who was the seventh, and met the grandson, who was the eighth, if he if he owns it. Uh, so it's been in the family a long, long time. And uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know why they, uh, uh, they, they missed this because it's a big part of Ohio history. Anyway, uh, I did not get a chance to go to the barn because there was some chaos in his trailer to disturb him. But his uh, daughter contacted me a year later and she said that uh, the barn burned down. The farmhouse has burned down three times, believe it or not. I can't believe that. But uh, John said he was born in it, and so was his dad, but uh, burned down. So uh, she wondered where the painting was. On my day, she didn't have it. So I said, Oh, this is a fundraiser I told you about uh, last, last year for the Adams County Humane Society. And uh, so she missed out. But uh, 
Well, this Dave has his, even though this, this one is gone. So, anyway, uh, I think I better stop now. <laughs> so, thank you all for coming. And, uh, yeah. Yes, artist. Thank you for your gift. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. Um, the gentleman who painted on the barn. Yes. For the bicentennial. Um, or no, the sentence. Okay, I'm from Pennsylvania. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no. Um, <laughs> have you ever met him? Uh, I've communicated with him. He's from Belmont County, out near the county line. Okay. And he was mentored by Hardy Warwick, who did all the mail pouch farms the last oh, yeah. 30, 40 years. And you have some in your, in your state. Right. And oh, so I know a lot of them actually. And so Scott Hayden got a gig with the Ohio History Society to mm -hmm. paint the logo of many of the right. farms. Okay. In fact, it's taken by Bacon in Lake County because Lake County is essentially a suburb of Cleveland. It's the smallest right. county in Ohio. It's on the way to Pennsylvania. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's almost all developed. And I had such trouble. So I went back to my Ohio Bicentennial book. I found the barn. I found the address. I sent a letter to, I called the county auditor up. I got the address, the auditor sent a letter out. And I got a response. And the barn's still there. So that's the one that's in the book. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Oh, lucky. That's cool. Very cool. Very lucky. So. Yeah. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, my brother bought an old farmhouse. Um, Civil War in Licking County, and he had they, the owners had burnt the barn down before he bought it. So he had a barn taken down on Lake Erie and had the beams and stuff brought down. Do you consider that an old barn or a new barn? The inside's old, but the outside they had to put. I've not done I've not done an event for Licking County, so. If you contact the historical society, I'd love to come out there and see it. Okay, yeah, all right. We'll do an event just like this one. <laughs> it's like a woman with lots of uh, surgery. She's <laughs> 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 older, she knows. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> lots of plastic surgery. No, if it's timber frame. Any time I go into a barn, it's timber frame with the uh, mortise and tenon joints and the wooden pegs, it takes my breath away. Even though I've been in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of those, every time I go in there, I think about these pioneers putting the barn together, cutting the trees down, chopping them up. Yeah, it's amazing. Yes, ma'am. One of the paintings is ours, our barn, and I wondered if I could get your picture with it. Oh, sure. <laughs> sure. Okay. Yes, yes. Be happy to. Yeah. Oh, really you already did. Oh. <laughs> Be yeah. happy to. I wanted to make sure that our folks on Zoom had the opportunity to ask questions too. Lauren, do you have any questions? I do not have any questions yet, but I do have a comment. Um, Mary would just like to thank Bob for his generous and amazing contributions to the auction. You're very welcome. Very welcome. We, I do have, actually, we just had a question come in. I just wanted to mention, um, I haven't met you, but I've seen your name on the uh, Farms of Ohio Facebook page. Facebook person. Oh, yes. yes thank you. <laughs> What's your name? Sherry Wells. Sherry, right. Sherry Wells. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. You know, I just got into Facebook. Uh, the page I have is the Historic Barn Project or Historic Barn Project. Um, because I'm not a techie at all, but uh, I met a fellow from Indiana who did the uh, uh, Facebook page uh, a couple of years ago called uh, Brown Barns of America Facebook page. Hmm. And we had a meeting when I went to a round barn uh, last fall after I was in Indiana. That's my next project right now, round barns. But I'll continue to do barns in Ohio as long as I can. But uh, he told me that Facebook is mostly people over 50, 60, 70. And I always thought it was the 20 something, you know? <laughs> oh no, well, they're on uh, Instagram. Well, they were uh, on it at first. 
At first they were. <laughs> they really so I had no idea. Look so, uh, the old books. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I've only been on a couple months, but I met some wonderful people. And thank you for coming. Yeah. If you ever get to New York, there's a barn in there's a barn in Greene County, New York. It's a historical society property. My husband's ancestor owned that property back in the 1600s. What's the name? Bronk, James Bronk. I've done that painting already. The 13-sided barn. Will you please get in contact with me? <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to go out there to see it. Yeah, the name was Bronk, which was uh, at one Dutch. Time, at Dutch? One, yeah, at one time they thought it, he was related to the person who the Bronx is named after but they the guy who that's named after had no children yeah. so but the way i understood it was the name the bronx in new york city was derived from the bronx name yeah oh but please they, please get in touch with me thank you so much uh, yeah this yeah i just wanted to comment the the, the uh, pagoda barn henry county yes i'm the guy that gave you the photo of it from Putnam County, I'm from Putnam County. Yes, thank you so much. <laughs> so anyway, but I don't know if you drove out there to see the site. No, I did but, not. I mean, the, no. the, the site is still there. Yeah. I mean, the foundation or whatever is still yes. there. If anybody wanted yeah. to drive out and the see barn? it. No, the barn, I took the photo, I think, in the mid-70s. Mid-70s, yes. And mid it's been gone for yeah. 40 years. But the land has never been cleared or anything. So I think it's on 65 North where 18 I did, I did not know that where 18 goes west to Hamler. It's between Deschler and Hamler. Okay, Marilyn. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> I wanted to drive out and look at it. Well there's not there for weeks, but yeah. Know, so. Yes, that gentleman was kind to give me a photograph that I used to do that painting. I, I done one earlier in green from pictures that are preserved but, but uh, you and you were you and Dr. Poppelman were at my right. barn. Yeah. But unfortunately we had severe wet wind around Thanksgiving and it blew the part of the top out. So it's going to be coming down. But, but I, I got it, I got it in time. Yeah. yeah, you gave me the work copy and it's supposed to be in the Putnam County auction. I don't know. Yeah, you've got to contact uh, the Kiwanis. Right. But they just keeps getting postponed. No, well, I think because, I think if you contact the Kiwanis guy, he'll sell it to you. Well, I can look out the window and see it. But I don't know if you're familiar with who Jan is. Antique wow. Beam and Board from Delta, oh, Ohio. They're supposedly going to take it down and refurbish all the and reuse all the stuff. Oh, that's nice. Oh, cool. So I don't. They're saying oh. late spring, so I don't know. Oh, that's nice. So, Thank you for that. Yep. Have a comment. Yes, sir. Your um beautiful card here, the poster also. I have seen magnets made, and I don't know if you're doing any marketing, but I think those would make fabulous uh, magnets that could be sold at historical societies in Ohio. Yeah. Well, they do things a little up My permission all the time to go and do it. You know. No, I didn't do that. That came from the but, You know, but that's that's beautiful, and it would make a great magnet. Right. Okay, Lauren, one last chance. Anybody on Zoom? Yes, we have one question that says, "Has Bob ever attended an Amish barn raising?" There's still some combination stuff. I had a Mennonite lady come yesterday. Um, well, I did uh, the barn of Mr. Summer, Keith Summer, in Putnam County, and Keith is a Mennonite. Uh, He's the most knowledgeable yes. barn person I've ever met in my life. Uh, he does reenactments, uh, incredible guy. So if you consider that, since it came from his ancestors, gave me black walnut, which was uh, then a reciprocating saw for the frame. Um, yes, I, that's- I think they wanted to know if you had attended a raising, if you'd seen a raising. Oh, before. I've seen one done, uh, uh, Adams County a long time ago. Yes, I did. Okay, well, I think we will move things into the exhibit center where Bob will be able to sign uh, your okay. book if you purchased a book. If you'd like to still purchase a book, they're available at the front desk, so you can get one there. Again, the raffle tickets are available at the front desk as well, and we'll probably be drawing the winner for the raffle 
um, here in the next few minutes. So I'll just give you maybe 10 more minutes or so to get the raffle tickets if you'd like to do so. Um, if we could, Prop's going to be at a table in the back corner of our exhibit center here. So if we could form a line there, and if you could just kind of respect some distance in the line as well. This is a fan. I couldn't do it. I took it off. I couldn't. I just couldn't in my heart. I couldn't do it. No. Oh, it doesn't say anything. Does anyone like a fun No, knowing you, no. No, no, it won't hurt anybody. I, I, I was at a April Fool breakfast one. I know. I it won't hurt anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody want it? We can put it with another one. Oh, I already got it. I just couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. What is it, though? Oh, all it is is that it's. I made the crossing very, 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 very Everybody very, on the same one wanted to see this. <laughs> so you would get into it. Well, but it wouldn't be. 